Speaking of old school, here's Delegate John Hardy. John, by telephone from the Capitol. Good morning, sir. I just listened to you curmudgeons complain about how everything is not how it used to be when you were growing up. And <laughs> walk to school six miles barefoot, both uphill, both ways. You know, in all honesty, <laughs> I, 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 lived, I lived in a school district where everybody <laughs> lived within a mile of the school, so there wasn't a bus. Mm -hmm. So they rarely canceled school. And I did live at the bottom of a hill, so I literally had to walk uphill to get to the school. Better for it. Yeah, I am. I'm, the, I'm, I'm better, much better for it. School, <laughs> yeah. Snow doesn't scare me anymore. Uh, John, let's uh, let's talk uh, what you guys are doing down there in Charleston. I was talking to uh, excuse me, <laughs> <coughs> Senator Mike Stewart in the first segment, and he's going to be introducing some death penalty legislation in the state Senate. Is there an appetite? For that in the House, his is specific and fairly narrow in its scope in that it's going to uh, target people who uh, kill first responders uh, in cold blood. Is there any appetite for something like that in the House? Uh, I, I, you know, I've not heard it mentioned in the House. I mean, you got to realize it's uh, election season. There's a lot of people running for uh, new offices. So, you know, there's going to be some rhetoric. There's going to be some people talking about legislation that has good sound bites, but uh, probably doesn't have a lot of steam in the legislature. I, I, you know, I'm, I've not heard it talked about on the House side. Uh, I don't think it's one of the House's priorities. It's very early, uh, but, you know, it is election season. There's lots of rhetoric coming out from a lot of different people that are trying to move up or change positions. And, you know, I, I, I guess I paint myself with that same brush, but I try to keep things um, you know, to legislation that is that can actually happen or legislation that I think will make a difference. You know, Steve Catlett preceded you, and he is uh, with members of the county commission and their lobbying group uh, headed to Charleston soon to try to lobby for home rule and a 1% sales tax uh, for counties. Uh, what, you are running for county commission after your term expires in the House of Delegates, John. I know we've talked with you about this uh, previously, but if you could reiterate your position on allowing counties to have home rule and the ability to enact a, even if it's by referendum, a 1% sales tax. Yeah, it's not a piece of legislation that I've really gotten behind. I'm, I'm not really inter interested in raising taxes on West Virginia taxpayers. Uh, there's probably a certain version of the bill that I may be able to get behind. I mean, if it became out and it was permissive to the county commissions and also it was passed by a public referendum, uh, that may be something that I could support, but just uh, blindly giving the county commissions the ability to tax at this time, uh, it's just not something that I'm interested in uh, championing or be involved with. I, I, I'm not with the skyrocketing inflation that uh, our citizens are living under right now. I'm just not interested in giving the county um, the counties the ability to tax. I feel if we do give them the ability to tax, they will. Um, so, you know, that, that view could change as I got into the county commission and understood their budget more. But, um, you know, right now at this point in time, I'm, I'm working on a legislative budget and uh, I'm representing the citizens of the 97th. And it's just not something that I'm interested in moving forward right now. John, would you be interested if it came with the proviso that it had to go to referendum and let the voters decide? I mean, that you, you're now putting it in the hands of the voters uh, if they want to raise the tax upon themselves uh, for, con you know, consumer-based tax, which I've always, I've said on the show many times, consumer-based tax are, are is if you're going to tax, it's a good way to tax because you're picking up a lot of pass-through economy and you're picking up a lot of cash economy. If you want to enact that tax to pay for services, you know, um, more fire, more EMS um, services that the county needs, uh, certainly if there was a referendum vote and the citizens passed that, then certainly you could support that. Matt. Well, I'm, I'm going to speak for Rob here, who had a little bit of a rant in, in the conversation with Steve Catlett, and, and just ask the direct question of uh, part of the Republican agenda uh, seems to be that, that there needs to be more local control, and now the Republicans control the state legislature with an opportunity to provide some local control to counties that say, we need some financial help, and yet this legislature says, eh, we, we're not sure we want to do that. How do you, you know, make those two work out when you say local control is needed, but we don't really want to give it? I think local control doesn't always mean local tax. Local control can mean uh, more oversight in how the local government is run, uh, you know, how, how things are, are run in a government. It doesn't always mean to add taxes. Um, so I've, 
I've worked down here on lots of different things for local control, and, and sometimes they've come back to bite us. I mean, sometimes the more local control that we've given some organizations, um, they've refused to take that control and, and uh, have not worked within the purview of what we wanted to do. So I'm not saying that the county commissions would do that. I'm just saying that if we're going to give them the ability to tax, I think that the taxpayers should have some say in that. And you could say that they're through, they are duly elected officials, and if people don't like it, they can vote them out. Uh, but, you know, county commission is a six-year term versus a house term, which is two years term. So you're a little closer to the people. As far as uh, what's going on right now in the legislature as uh, this session is underway, you, you mentioned uh, you're working on a, a state budget. How are things coming in that regard? I'm here and talk about some legislation that I have that's working that, uh, you know, we really haven't gotten too far into the budget process yet. We've only had a few budget hearings. Uh, there's been some, um, you know, uh, meetings with the governor, working with the governor's budget. You know, the governor proposes a budget that had about a half a billion dollars of new spending, which I uh, don't think much of that is going to remain in that budget. Uh, the governor gave a real good, feel good speech. He didn't give a lot of detail, didn't go into a lot of policy. He kept it very, very vanilla, which if I was in the governor's situation and I was leading the Senate race by some say 20 to 30, even more than 30 points, I think I would keep my speech very vanilla, too. So uh, I don't think a lot of that new spending that the governor has talked about is going to make its way into the final House budget. I'm quite certain it won't make its way into the Senate budget. So I think some of that new spending will probably um, will just be kind of pie in the sky stuff that the uh, governor had in his feel-good speech. So I would like to talk to you guys a little bit about, you know, I've, I've really been talking a lot about the senior citizen real property tax refund. Yes. Um, that, that's been in place. Uh, it had some pretty hard uh, at- obtainable uh, measures to be able to get that. So I've been working for the last three months on this piece of legislation to, to uh, be able to bolster the amount of money that's in that fund that comes from excess lottery and also to lower the standard in which our senior citizens can obtain that tax refund. Uh, I'm very proud to say that the governor has picked that bill up, and that's going to be a governor's priority bill. So that will no longer be my bill. It will not be a House bill. It will be the governor's bill, uh, and that's great because that means that it has a really, really good chance of getting done. We'll be changing that criteria from 125 percent of the poverty rate to 200 percent of the poverty rate, and we'll be bolstering that fund from $10 million to $3 million. So we've had all the numbers run, and uh, – our, uh, our number crunchers say that we, they think we can do that for around $13 million a year to be able to uh, have this tax refund that it can apply to our most vulnerable population, our senior citizens who are living in their homes, um, uh, who are living on fixed incomes, but the uh, rapid rise in real estate property taxes are, are hindering um, them uh, with what they're paying in property taxes. And again, did I hear you correctly? You said this is a bill that would create a tax refund, so it's something they would still have to pay but then get back? This bill is already created. This legislation has already been created. We are just expanding it. We are making it so it's an easier opportunity for our seniors to seize upon it. Seniors as in what age? Uh, Receive the homestead exemption. Okay. So so I think the homestead exemption is 65 or older. All right. What is the current homestead exemption, John? 20,000? It is. It's 20000 but this would build on top of that. This would be the $20,000 exemption of the homestead, plus this you could receive this tax refund on the first $10,000 of the value of your home. So um, you won't lose your homestead exemption. This actually builds upon it. Now, you're probably looking at somewhere maybe around a $280 to $350 tax refund, which is not a lot of money, but if you're living on a fixed income of $1,250 a month, that's a lot of money. Hey, when, when you don't have it, every dollar means something, yeah. man. Sure, right. sure. Yep. So uh, that's that's one piece of legislation that I'm that I'm really happy. Uh, you know, we've worked really hard on that. The governor's office has seen the value in that, and the governor's office will be uh, moving that legislation forward. Second thing I want to talk about was the uh, thirty million dollar one time funding for courthouse and judicial centers for repairs and upgrades. So we have uh, we've been working pretty hard to ex- uh, with our court expansions. Um, so we have areas that have growing population. We also have areas where their courthouses are in dire need of repairs. So I'm proposing a one-time $30 million funding, uh, one-time money in the back of the budget, surplus revenue, uh, for a 50-50 grant matching program where uh, counties can apply 
to the Courthouse Facilities Improvement Fund uh, for grants, for uh, expansions, for new judges, expanding the courts, and also maintenance and repairs of existing courthouses and judicial centers. John, I... Uh, as you know, Go ahead. As you know, Ber Berkeley County has expanded its magistrates, its, its circuits are going to expand. Jefferson County circuits are expanding. There's going to be need for new courtroom space. What else do you have going, John? Um, so uh, I have a small bill that is a municipal water shutoff bill. Uh, there are a few municipalities across the state that are turning people's water off for non-payment of stormwater management fees. Um, I don't feel that that is fair. I feel that those are completely separate utilities. I've had a conversation with the Public Service Commission. They feel the same way. Um, you know, I'm not sure how a city can go in and tell um, American Water to turn someone's water off because they haven't paid their uh, stormwater management fee to the city. Uh, I think it's very easy for the city municipalities to go turn someone's water off with maybe not due process. So this bill will allow the cities to turn your water off for non-payment of stormwater management fees, but you must go through the legal process to do that. No more of just sending your water department over to turn someone's water off. So they must go through the legal processes of filing a lien uh, and going in front of the courts to be able to do this. How late do you have to be, do you know, before they can turn your water off? That will be done in the rulemaking. That I think that the municipalities maybe I'm not sure what their ruling is and when they turn your water off or how, I don't know if it's 15 days, 30 days, 45 days. I'm not sure, but I just don't think that you should be able to turn someone's water off or not. It's like if you didn't make your house payment, they repossess your car. I just, it, it really doesn't make sense to me. They are separate utilities. They are utilities, but they are separate utilities. Right. Right. What, what uh, would be, other than late fees, fines, uh, what have you, what would, what would be an appropriate way for stormwater management to get their money back for someone who doesn't pay the fees? Well, the court systems do do it that way. If they, if the, if the, if the municipalities are so hell bent on getting the money that they need for their stormwater management, that if they if someone is not paying, it's just as me as a small business owner. If someone does not pay me, I can't go and tear off what I've built on their home, or I can't go undo what I've done. I have to go through the legal processes, and I believe the municipalities should do the same thing. John, you are uh, also serve on uh, as part of your committees, Health and Human Resources, correct? Uh, Amy Summers sponsored a bill designed to give uh, DHHR more transparency, to improve their transparency. D uh, it's Bill 4595, according to this Metro News article by Mike Nolting. Have, are you familiar with that bill? I, I have briefly read over that bill, and that's a bill that I support. I think that we need to have as much transparency into those organizations as possible. And I will tell you that it is uh, the purview of the Finance Committee to do some serious deep dives into those agencies and also the sub agencies uh, to make sure that we are performing uh, what that um, you know, subsection of the agency is to do, uh, make sure that they are spending the money where they're supposed to be spending it, doing what they're supposed to be doing and achieving what they're supposed to be achieving and make sure that they're not just a, an agency, agency that has been created to chase federal dollars. There is some fear among uh, apparently a few people that the splitting of these three agencies for DHHR, instead of the goal was to streamline and reduce duplication of services, instead will become something that's even bigger than what the original DHHR was, John. How can you assure people who have those concerns that that won't be the case? You can assure anyone that that won't happen. That is going to be the purview of future legislators and, and the legislature. I think that's where voters need to hold people accountable. Um, I think that the more transparency and the more that we can break this agency down into smaller bites uh, so we can have more eyes on it and making sure that they are, the funding is being used the way the funding is supposed to be used um, and they are doing the jobs that they are supposed to be doing. There's, there is plenty of problems in DHHR. Um, in all three aspects of it. And uh, I am actually proud that this legislature has uh, taken some steps to at least try to address it. Um, you know, you can sweep it under the rug for a long time, but eventually um, it's going to be time to pay the piper. And, and this legislature has uh, kind of taken the, the, the bull by the horns and said, we're going to address this. 
We're going to address the jails, uh, the CPS workers. Uh, we, we know that there are some serious issues that, uh, that we need to have some um, serious discussions and uh, work together to try to figure out how to fix some of these broken agencies. John, you're also the vice chair of finance, and my question to you concerns a possible continuation of reduction of state income tax, the personal income tax. I have done a lot of interviewing on this subject for 2024, and I've gotten a lot of opinions that have said it's pretty much a slam dunk. We're going to be able to do the full 10% uh, for personal income tax reduction this coming year. And then I read a report uh, which quoted one of the deputy secretaries of revenue saying that 10% 10% might be a stretch. It might be closer to maybe 1% or 2 or 3%. John, as the vice chair of finance, you've got the handle on how the money is flowing in this state. What do you think? Yeah. Those, are, those triggers are very specific. Those triggers are set in statute. So, in other words, they, they are set in statute. So, they, there is no gray area in those triggers. And I think that it will take the revenue secretary, it will take the House finance, it will take the Senate finance to really sit down. And that's something that we're working on to uh, look at those numbers and really do a deep dive into see where we're going to be. I think we're going to be somewhere between the 8 and 10%, but I think those triggers will be hit for some type of cut uh, in the personal income taxes. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll hit the full 10%, but I do feel confident that we're going to be somewhere up, um, around the eight, above 7%. Matt, how long is it going to take to kind of get an idea of of what the income tax reduction really means to the state as far as people having a little more money in their pocket and then being able to put it back into this economy and see it continue to grow? Well, at a minimum of three years to see how this plays out. I mean, the triggers are set in statute. We are very, very confident and hopeful that the uh, growth in economy, uh, new businesses, new people moving to the state, uh, money that is being spent in other areas of the state, um, you know, developing new uh, new economies, uh, moving away from just being a single fossil fuel economy state, um, trying to move into a, a, a you know a new aged economy uh, with lots of different diversity. We're hoping that that will outpace the growth of that will outpace um, the, um, the the reduction in revenues that we're receiving from our uh, personal income taxes. You mentioned earlier as well one of the big issues, uh, jails and, and corrections and, and facilities, as well as, as uh, you know, officers and those who are needed. Uh, how are things coming with that? I think that there's, there's, there's definitely a turn. I think, you know, we're graduating classes. We are um, really trying to put, uh, retain the people that we have that have been in those positions and working very hard to um, attract new people to those positions. I think in an area like the, the Eastern Panhandle where the economy is a little bit, uh, a little faster moving and things, the cost of living is a little more. I think with the um, triggers that was put in there for, um, you know, there were certain triggers put in there where there would be more money paid as, as, as they needed more officers. So I think those things are probably helping. Um, I, I think that that's a, a work in progress and I think that's going to take some time to see and, and continual I think we will continually have to work on that as a process um, to make sure that we are trying to keep, retain the uh, officers and the staff that we have uh, and also continue to uh, train and move new people into positions there, trying to pay them the absolute best that we can pay them for a very tough and thankless job. Early on in this legislative session, are you hearing much regarding uh, the potential for, for lack of a better term, locality pay? I know we've tried to couch it in different terms at times to be able to get it through uh, with some of the folks from the southern part of the state, but how are things going there? Yeah, I was really sad, and I really thought that there was going to be something in the governor's speech about locality pay. I had been hearing some rumblings uh, that the governor was going to uh, talk a little bit about locality pay and and understanding that uh, certain areas of the state, not not just not just the Eastern Panhandle, but you know Mason County and even some of the poorer counties in the southern part of the state, may need, you know, different areas of the state need different options. And I was a little saddened that the governor didn't speak on that stuff. I was hoping that he would, um, but uh, you know it's really really early in the session, and I have, haven't heard anything. I haven't seen any bills, um, but I would like to segue into a very important piece of legislation that I've been working on if you guys would grant me that. Sure, you got three minutes, sir. Okay, so 
you know, I've been talking about the SRO, SRO funding for schools. So this is the John Hardy plan for funding of SROs throughout the state. So I am proposing that we uh, are going to set aside um, $28 million to fund SROs throughout the state. That $28 million is not going to cost the taxpayers any money. That $28 million is not going to cost the legislature any money. If you go in and look at our falling enrollment, if we fund our education system the same as we funded it in 2023, if we continue that funding on the same pace with our decline in enrollment, we will be able to have this money already within our budget to pay for these SROs. Now, I want it to be a qualified plan. I want it to go I want this money to be set aside. I want this money to go to the auditor's office. I want the auditor's office to set up this program. I don't want this going to the board of the state board of education. I want the money to go to the auditor's office. I want the auditor office to set this up in, in a formula that will be based on student population. And there will also be a secondary um, caveat in there that would say we are going to look at the distances from schools. So let's say you have a, two or three SROs in Morgan County, but you got Paul Paul, which is an outlier. Well, there's other counties that have those type of same instances. So I would like for this $28 million to go to the auditor's office. The auditor would be the one who would run this program. This money would come back to the county commission and the, it would come back to the county commission encumbered and the county commissions would be responsible for paying 70% or the, I'm sorry, the county commission, this money would come back to the county commissions, and this money would pay for 70% of the SROs. The other 30% would be paid for by the counties because those SROs will be deputy sheriffs. They can be utilized in the summer. They can be utilized in other parts of the community when they're not doing those functions. So I don't know if this legislation has any legs. I don't know where it goes, but that's what I'm proposing. Do you have a co-sponsor, John? The bill hasn't even been drafted yet. That's how new it is. I see. Uh, so the key factor is it's no new spending. It's $28 million of no new spending. There is money available in the education budget from the drawdown and, and, and our loss of enrollment to be able to, to draw that money out. And, and I, I really do not want it to go to the State Board of Education because the legislature has no oversight of that. We That money goes to the state Board of Education and it falls into a black hole because this legislature does not have any oversight of that branch of government. So that's why I think it should go to the auditor's office to be an outside entity. The, the fund would go there and the auditor would ultimately work with a board that he picks or the governor picks or has elected officials, however, this, however the rules are, are prom promulgated. And then that money would come back to the county commissions to go to the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department should be the one who is implementing the school resource officers. John, on that note, you've used your three minutes. I appreciate your time this morning. You always bring it. You, you did well. Thank you very much. It was great talking to all you guys. Everybody be safe back home. Thank you, John. Thanks.